morning. Uh, just a note of thanks to uh, Radiation Hope for uh, allowing us to spend a few minutes with you this morning. We're grateful for that. Uh, also, of course, uh, our partner also in different projects is KCMC, and uh, we're pleased to be here back with KCMC. Uh, my name is Jim Cox, and I'm the country director here uh, with IMA Tanzania. Uh, I am going to just uh, speak shortly, as Sister Margaret is our technical advisor in this area. Uh, so she knows this stuff far better than I do. I'll just take you through a couple of slides of background and then I hand it over to Sister Margo. Uh, as mentioned, we are a U.S.-based, faith-based organization that focuses on public health. Uh, as you may know, in Tanzania, you are sitting in a faith-based facility right now and that uh, those facilities make up a significant amount of work and uh, assistance to Tanzania along with their government partner, of course, but that is one of our primary missions is that we are supporting those agencies that are faith-based and involved in public health. Uh, so you'll always see our projects somehow interwoven or working with faith-based organizations as part of that. Uh, so the mission is straightforward, advancing health and healing to vulnerable and marginalized people. Uh, we've been in existence for 50 years ourselves, but we've been active in Tanzania now for over 17 years. And our current program portfolio uh, right now includes uh, three areas, HIV AIDS, neglected tropical diseases, and the one that I think you are interested in hearing about is our non-communicable diseases section, which has two cancers within that, BL and cervical cancer. Next slide, Sister. Okay. Okay, then it's over to you. Yeah. All right, thank you. I'll hand it over to Sister Mark. Good morning to you all. From the high tech to the low tech rural community, what we are presenting now is not just a, a high tech presentation, but rural community, what we are doing at the grassroots. And the first presentation will be about expanding access to bucket lymphoma treatment in Tanzania. We are sharing our experience as IMA. Worldwide, according to WHO, we have 160,000 children developing cancer. Unfortunately, in Tanzania, we have no cancer registry, but the estimated number of children who develop cancer in Tanzania is 2,200 annually. 32% of those are Bacchus lymphoma cases making it the most common childhood cancer in the country. Briefly about Bucket's lymphoma, this is recognized as the fastest growing human tumor, and if untreated, it's fatal. But fortunately, it is among the few cancers responding to chemotherapy alone. Presentation, there is always a swelling. It can be an abdominal swelling, OBT, maxilla, mandible, gingiva, or palate, and this can be on one side or both sides. Fasciplum malaria and Epstein-Barr virus are the determinants of its occurrence. So in Tanzania, it's most, most common in the lake zone where malaria prevalence is very high. Why did IMA decide to carry on a program on bucket lymphoma? The following are the reasons. One is the disease burden. Because according to the studies made in this country, we have 700 new cases annually. And only 200 cases report to the hospital. What happens to the 500? they end up dying because it's fast growing and fatal if untreated. We also recognize that there was limited awareness among the community. People associated it with witchcraft, so they first, they first landed on a traditional health, health healers, and that also increased the rate attendance. There was poor access to quality health care and limited knowledge for health workers to diagnose, treat, or appropriately refer to the, patient, the patients. And for those who came to the hospital, the cost of chemotherapy puts them off 
they could not afford. So some went home because they could not afford. The rate reporting leading to many avoidable deaths due to Bucket's lymphoma. And also what motivated, motivated us most was that good response to treatment as we, you will see the pictures. The cancer treatment centers before we started was Dar es Salaam, Dar es Salaam here, KCMC, and uh, BMC, Bugando Medical Center. So you can imagine a person from here coming here or here or there. And these are poor people who cannot even afford to, to pay a, a bus fare for 50 kilometers. So many were dying because they could not reach the place. What was our goal? To improve access to Bucky's lymphoma treatment services through community sensitization for self-uptake, initiating Bucky's lymphoma treatment sites as near to the client's homes as possible. We scaled up from four facilities in 2000 to 30 facilities in 2010. We also invested in training healthcare professionals on health detection, appropriate treatment, or timely referral. This ensuring ownership and sustainable services. We also procure and distribute Bucket's lymphoma drugs to the treatment sites. And we are using the three drugs. We are using vincristin, methotrexate, and cyclophosphamide. And also, to ensure quality assurance, we do regular supportive supervision and monitoring. What has been our achievements? Scaling up of Bucky's lymphoma treatment sites from four in 2000 to 30 in 2010. Around 4,000 Bucky's lymphoma patients were reached and that counts about 56% of the expected total new Bucky's lymphoma cases in, two, in 10 years. Bucky's lymphoma triple therapy worth of 300,000 USD were purchased and distributed to 23 member facilities. And these facilities include also the referral hospitals, KCMC, Muimbili, Ocean Road Cancer Institute, and the Bugando Medical Center. We also developed and distributed to member facilities and training institutions the treatment guidelines for Bucket's lymphoma. And in fact, these were the first cancer treatment guidelines in the country. For those who have never seen Bucket's lymphoma, I would like you to appreciate by looking at these pictures, consents were given, before and after treatment. It's amazing. You really, you are enticed to invest in such a program. This is the boy before treatment, he had Bucket's, abdominal Bucket's lymphoma. Before treatment, and this is after three doses. For our regime, the first line treatment for Bucket's lymphoma, we give six doses. For every two weeks, you give another dose until six. But you can imagine this boy, this was before treatment, and I was talking to his father, he said, I, I had already despaired. I thought my boy was dying. But after three doses, the boy was smiling. That is another boy who was, could hardly take anything by mouth. And if you can see the eyes of the mother on top, she has already despaired. But after three doses, here is the boy. And this is a girl, Jacinta. This developed within three weeks. They could not imagine that it was a disease. They thought it was witchcraft. But after four doses, there is the beautiful girl. So it's really worth investing in such a program. It's paying. What are the challenges? Human resource. Staff turnover hampers training efforts. We train the staff at the site about how they can diagnose, how they can treat. In one year, in six months, they are transferred, they go to, to training, in, they, they, they move to another place. So you, you, you miss somebody who is really skilled to, 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 to manage the patients. And lack of staff, of, uh, 
skilled in diagnosis treatment, and treatment of Barkis lymphoma. There is also another challenge about poor patients tracking and follow-up mechanism. Because we need really to follow up, to follow them up when they are getting treatment, to follow them up after treatment so that we can pick up relapse timely. But the follow-up mechanism is really very, very difficult and we get sometimes lost to follow up. We are still getting people who report late for treatment, leading to poor treatment outcomes. And another um, challenge is the funding. Getting funding for this program is very, very difficult. And we are, we are also worried about sustainability when we pull off from the program. Our way forward, we intend to strengthen the 23 sites, Barkis lymphoma treatment sites in the country. We, also, we are also investing in a community awareness for early reporting because we still see many people coming very late. So we have brochures which are in Swahili and English. Swahili for our people and English for the volunteers who can come and give this awareness to the community. And to establish linkages with other stakeholders for collaboration and possible funding opportunities. I am sure this is one of the opportunities. What is the key message we can take? After seeing what we have done and how, how the children have been helped, I think even in low resource countries, with good planning and some funding, it's possible to give quality treatment to more children and improve their survival outcome. Action needs to be taken now to improve the care and support of children in a cancer, with cancer in Tanzania. It begins with me. It begins with you. Welcome. Thank you. The second presentation now is about another program we are doing, uh, about the cervical cancer screening program. And I want to share how we are integrating cervical cancer screening into HIV ART services. The data about the burden of cervical cancer has been repeatedly said, so I don't need to say it again. Only that is among, Tanzania is among the countries with the highest cervical burden. And the cervical cancer is the leading cause of cancer mortality among Tanzanian women. For the past 12 years, this is Ocean Road Cancer Institute data, cervical cancer ranks number one for the top 10 cancers for the past 12 years, it is number one for the top 10 cancers. So it's really a problem. How is HIV related to cervical cancer? Nearly all cervical cancers, around 99%, are linked to infection with the human papilloma virus, a sexually transmitted disease. The HIV positive women are particularly vulnerable to human papilloma virus. Because in HIV infected women, human papilloma virus are detected more frequently and they resolve more slowly. HIV infected women have an increased risk of developing precancerous lesions, are likely to have a recurrence of prefrontal precancerous lesions even after treatment. And precancerous lesions progress rapidly to cancer, unlike the HIV negative where they can take 5, 10, 15 years. For HIV positive women, it can take less, much less than that. Therefore, HIV positive women have higher chances of developing high, uh, cervical cancer, almost five times or more. What is our approach to cervical cancer screening program? What do we do? We first do the advocacy at regional and district and facility level. <coughs> with the collaboration with the facility level, people who are eligible for the training for cervical cancer screening are identified according to the national guidelines and are trained accordingly. We do community sensitization for service uptake. 
and our approach is daily screening. And the single visit approach, we, we screen and treat for those who have precancerous lesion on the same day. Because we have few sites and distance is really a challenge for the clients, we also do outreach services. In this program, we have integrated breast cancer screening into it. So when the woman comes for cervical cancer screening, she's as well screened for breast cancer. And we do quarterly supportive supervision. The importance of this approach, the advocacy is for ownership and sustainability because we don't intend to stay doing this program eternally. They have to take over as regions, as district heavy, heavy personnel. And also the daily screening prevents missed opportunities. Because when people come to visit in the hospital and they see the advertisement, they go to, 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 to screen. Even if somebody, the mother has brought the child for, for, for treatment, she take that, takes that opportunities for screening. So the daily screening really pre also prevents missed opportunities. They improve, it improves accessibility and coverage and also quality services assurance. Unlike the KCMC, which are blessed with more modalities for screening, for us, we have visual inspection with acetic acid only, via. And we really need to bank on this because it is very simple. It is safe. It is acceptable by the community. It is effective. In fact, compared to pap smear, the sensitivity and the specificity is very good. It's relatively cheap because you can use even midi cutters to screen. You don't need a, a pathologist, you don't need a gynecologist like in the pap. It saves humans time. You screen, you find the precancerous lesion, you treat. There is no go back and come back, no. And it prevents also loss to follow up because you are doing it on the same day. How do we integrate cervical cancer screening services with HIV? The national guidelines target women between 30 and 50 years, and all HIV women irrespective of their age. But for us, any woman who comes for screening, we offer counseling and testing services. And lucky enough, they agree. So we test them for HIV before screening them. So when they are found HIV positive, we screen them for cervical cancer, but at the same time, we refer them for care and treatment. Our aim is to screen all HIV women attending care and treatment in the region. And even if we have two clinics, we have the general clinic, but we always make sure that there is a clinic situated at the care and treatment unit so that those who come for care and treatment unit for HIV services, they are also screened. And the CACS, yeah. Yeah, CACS screening clinics are intentionally located at the RCH, at the reproductive waste section, but as well as at the care and treatment clinics. This is what we have done between August 2011 to December 2013. We have screened a total of 6,865. And we have broken up the two, to HIV negative, HIV positive, HIV unknown, which has also has an implication on the program. We don't like this. But from the total screened, we got 412 were VIA positive. They had precancerous lesion, and that comes to 6%. That's high. But also, we, I would like you to note this. Out of the 412, 130 were, were HIV positive. So out of the VIA positive, 32% were, were HIV positive, indicating the association the strong association between HIV and the cervical cancer. This is just a repetition how much we have screened. The overall positivity rate is 6%, but there is high positivity in HIV-positive women. 
the single visit approach, for those who are screened and treated, the average is low, 74. Because some are not eligible, some have infections, but we have noted women in the rural areas have to ask their husband whether they should be screened, they should be treated or not. Because when you screen, you find precancerous lesion. When you treat with cryotherapy, the woman has to abstain for four weeks from sexual intercourse. So for a married woman who has no decision, she has to ask her husband. So in the rural area, we found that the single visit approach is jeopardized. They, 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 it is low. But for, for women in the town, in one of the, of, the, of the sites in the town, we have the single visit approach of 98 because women can decide on their own. I have precancerous resolution, I want treatment, I will tell my husband. For, but for the rural, oh, I can't get treatment until my husband gets, gives consent. So we need to do more than screening to build <laughs> the economic power of the women. And we have found that this is also an avenue. By screening, by linking screening for HIV and screening for cervical cancer, cervical cancer now has been an avenue for getting clients for ART services. So linking them is very important as they are linked also by their strong association. But the program goes, it doesn't go without challenges. What I find as the biggest challenge is that cervical cancer, much as it is important, much as it is killing most of our women here, it's not getting the attention it deserves. I wish people from KSMC were here because if you talk about 6,000 screening of women in a country where we have, I don't know how many million women, it's just a peanut. So we haven't given it the attention it deserves. They are also competing health priorities. People, when you talk about cervical cancer screening, they talk about HIV, they talk about the prevention of mother to child, there is malaria. So that also reduces the attention. Distance from, for clients, they have to walk quite a distance before they reach the screening site. And that's why to address that, we have started the outreach services. We have only one radiotherapy center, Ocean Road Cancer Institute. You saw that, that, uh, that map. Ocean Road Cancer Institute is in Dar es Salaam. There are sites which are more than 2,000 kilometers from Dar es Salaam. So when you have one center and you detect during screening that this one has a cervical cancer, she needs to go to Ocean Road. Then many people are not going there because they can't afford the fare. They, they are worried about what will be the outcome. They can't see their relatives. So it is really a very big challenge. We have interrupted the supply of HIV test kits. In the, in the, in the data I showed you, we have many unknown status, and for us, it has an implication. Because when the, the, the mother is HIV positive, even if she is via negative, she doesn't have precancerous lesion. We need to track that patient and follow up on a yearly basis, on an annual basis. But if we don't know her HIV status, we give her the follow up after three years. So those are the, the patients who later develop cervical cancer without our notice. Human resource is always a problem. Cervical cancer screening is a very tedious procedure. And for the staff we are using for screening, there are also multiple responsibilities. So they develop staff fatigue and some drop out. So this is really a big challenge. Low awareness. And what I have noted is not low awareness to, to the community. It's also low awareness to the health professionals. And that's why the attention is too low. It is not getting the attention it deserves. Unfortunately, we have a single CO2 gas supplier in the country. So you can imagine, sometimes you are in a very remote area, you need gas, and the gas supplier is in Dar es Salaam. It is really very difficult to keep the supply of gas constantly at the site, and sometimes Patients have gone back home because there was no site, there was no gas at the site. Cryo machine servicing. For the freezing of the precancerous lesion, we use cryo machines for 
treatment. But this, we have no technicians here in the country for servicing those. And there is a private practitioner who is servicing the machines for servicing only. It is $300. How much are we going to pay for the servicing of 10, 20 machines? It's also a challenge. And I think the people, if you have, you can train some people to, to do the servicing. I think it will be of much help as we, we expand the screening services. And the follow up is also another problem. As I have just said, if the patient has pre cancer resolution, you treat, you have to follow up annually. If the patient is HIV positive, irrespective of the VIA uh, 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 results, you have to follow up annually. So it is really very important to track them. And some are not coming, even we are calling, they don't come. What has been the lessons learned? We are training the health providers, but what I have noticed, we should not rely on the training only. We need really to continuously build the capacity through site supervisions by experienced people. And fortunately for visual inspection, as it was said yesterday, mid-level providers, nurses, clinical officers, can effectively provide VIA and the cryotherapy. And also strengthening, monitoring, and evaluation is key. We need to encourage the site to collect it, quality data, first to use their data to improve their services. Also, and uh, we get it for also improvement. And also, referral mechanism needs to be strengthened. Outreach services overcome distance barriers and improves coverage. But also, more research is needed in our setup for evidence-based practices. Our future plan is to strengthen the existing sites, to conduct monthly outreach services for coverage, program scale up, increase awareness among parents for human papilloma virus vaccine through partnership with the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education. We also we are pleading with the ministry that cervical cancer screening is included in the pre-service trainings. This we think is a more sustainable approach than operating it as a program. Thank you very much.